Oh boy. It's going to get real today. Um, we're uh, really looking forward to uh, this discussion with all of you. This is your Nature Journal Educators Forum. If you've never been here before, welcome. If you're an old timer, welcome back. And uh, we are going to unpack a can of worms today. Um, we have your regular three hosts. Myself, I'm John Muir Laws. We have Billy Joe Reed and Vea Moore, the mad botanist herself. We are also joined today by Brooke Morales, our guest co-host here. And uh, we're going to be, uh, with all of you, kind of unpacking um, unpacking our labels and, uh, and how these labels are, um, are used and, and affect education and children as well as us adults. Uh, we're going to be looking at personality tests. We're going to be looking at the concept of learning styles and um, what happens, what is the scientific background for these things. Uh, this is interesting because depending on where you came into um, uh, your sort of training in in, uh, in 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 education, you would probably have heard very different things about some very different things. And it's going to be fun. So if you're new here to this specific series, today what we have to do on Wednesdays is a bunch of us educators get together and we chew the fat a little bit about different issues in education that relate to our work as educators and uh, nature journalists. And this, we kind of hit the, t uh, we kind of bumped into an iceberg um, on one of our, 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 our previous workshops and realized that there's so much more underneath the water there <laughs> that uh, it would be fun to kind of unpack that a little bit more. Um, so we want to be talking about personality, personality tests, and, um, and, because, and, and other ways which we get our labels. Labels, um, I'll, I'll just sort of, I'm going to just rant a little bit and then um, what we what we can do is we can just sort of like you know tag team ranting um, but uh, also if anybody has uh, comments thoughts or ideas please feel free to uh, drop those into the chat and also you can use the raise hand function and get in on the conversation and then um, uh, and I also oh, I want to um, let you know that this um, that, that we really want to 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 hear from you. So even if you're new to this and you're like, oh, I've got a thought on that, um, you don't have to like you know prove yourself for being here for a while. As our only kind of ground rules are that everybody's respectful and kind to each other in anything we're talking about. We can disagree with each other, and that's totally fine. But we're never mean, right? So no mean, and um, that. Uh, that that makes that that just sort of makes things a lot more fun. Um, so first, I, I want to talk just a little bit about the idea of of personality um, because <laughs> we've all got one um, and they're different and otherwise we'd all be the same. Um, but when uh, psychologists psychologists uh, psych uh, psychologists dig kind of beneath the surface and start looking at personality, we discover that a whole bunch of what we do is situational. Like, do you act differently when you are with your grandparents than when you're with um, the folks in the gym? Yes, <laughs> we all do. So, um, and and so, it, it uh, some part of that is sort of there's this stuff that is kind of embedded in our heads of of, of who we are um, as. A psychologist look around, we find that human beings tend to act in very kind of predictable ways um, and that we're actually a lot more the same. That's why, you know, magic tricks and advertising work, right? Because you can really predict the way that human beings work. But we do have, you know, our own little quirks and things. Um, and and but there's this idea that there's sort of like this deep kind of within us, there's this, this personality homunculus down there and it's kind of pulling our strings. And people have a long time tried to kind of tease out why that is. Like one of the early things on this, there's, you've all heard of the marshmallow study? 
right? The, the marshmallow study, what it was, is that they, they think we discovered like here's this this thing this this personality trait we can test kids on it when they're really really little and it's an incredible predictor of their success later in life right and um what it was is they said uh, they go to kids and they say we're going to give you a marshmallow you can eat this marshmallow now but if you can wait just 10 minutes when we come back we'll give you three so do you want one now or three later? And you think like, wow, that's a pretty good deal. And see, what they found was that kids who ate the marshmallow um, uh, uh, immediately, um, later on when you test them, they're getting lower grades in school. Later on when you test them, they're getting jobs that are not as fulfilling or well-paying and even have more marital problems. So this marshmallow, it was a huge thing. So I think like we all have like this inner, like, you know, how, what is your executive control? How much can you like, you know, delay gratification? But really, when they kind of did some follow-up tests, here's, a, they ever find out that, have you heard that the marshmallow test is actually bunk? So the deal with the marshmallow test is that what they were, <laughs> what, what it actually seems to be is that um, these kids, um, are coming from all sorts of different socioeconomic groups and they have different levels of trust with adults. And if you are used to grown-ups telling you the truth and being reliable, then it makes sense to wait for those three marshmallows. But if you know that grown-ups are full of it and they say one thing but then they're going to deliver another, you better eat that marshmallow now. Otherwise, somebody else might eat your marshmallow. So these kids were actually making very intelligent decisions based on the experience that they had and it turns out that kids who come up from an environment where you can't really trust adults later on in life are struggling more right if you know having having a you know and a, a, a being growing up in an environment where you can trust adults <laughs> and where your address uh, your adults deserve your trust they've earned it right because those kids are basing this on whether we, we really kind of show up for them um, that's what that's what that test was. So it wasn't about their personality. It was whether or not they had trustworthy adults in their environment. Um, there are uh, there seem to be kind of some characteristics that you can see differences in human beings, um, and uh, there are there seem to be. A lot of the research sort of comes down to that there's there are there are five traits. Um, and so these are openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And you can find that we've all kind of at different times in our life are sort of different places on on all of these. And like you may know people who are more extroverted or more ex or, or introverted, but those also tend to change depending on the environment. How you act in school is different than how you act when you're out with the team. Um, but then there's personality types and tests to deliver on those. And that is a whole other kettle of fish. Um, so you may have taken the Myers-Briggs personality inventory. You may be familiar with the DISC um, personality test. Um, there are lots of these different sorts of things, or even these things where, you know, we're going to sort you into which house in Hogwarts you are. These are all different versions of, of, a, of, a, of a test. And we take these tests, and then we often are really amazed at how accurate the results are for us and uh, you look at the report it gives you like that's me to a T um, and that confirms to us that this must be true okay. um, I'm gonna just glance over at the gallery view and see if anybody's got their cameras on Have anybody taken the say one of these personality tests like the Myers-Briggs or one of these other ones did, did anybody did anybody take the test that I put the link to in the chat? All right. We did now. <laughs> You're doing it now. All right. Well, here's a spoilers coming on that. Um, how many people, when you got your result, found that it was fairly close to how you would assess yourself? 
Yeah. Um, I'm going to just, I'm going to bring on Billy Joe here. Um, so Billy Joe, you said that this, this kind of, kind of nailed you, right? Um, what, what were some of the statements that kind of, um, uh, rang true to you on that? Uh, I actually have it right here. So, um, it says, um, you have a great need for other people to like and admire you. I, I don't know if that's like a hundred percent true, but like it feels good when people like me. I don't know about admire. I don't really think that's necessary, mm -hmm. but I definitely don't like being hated. Um, it says you have a great deal of unused capacity, <laughs> which you have not turned into advantage. So I don't really feel like that's correct, but it says discipline and self-control outside. You tend to be worrisome and insecure on the inside. I feel like that's pretty true. Um, it says you prefer a certain amount of change and variety and become dissatisfied when hemmed by restriction and limitations. Uh, I, yeah, I can't stand that. Um, it says you pride yourself in an independent thinker and you do not accept other statements without satisfactory proof. I would say that's like partially true. I try to make sure that I am like, not passing on information that I, it hasn't been sort of proof. Um, you have a tendency to be critical of yourself. I feel like that's a hundred percent. At times you have serious doubts as to whether you have made the right decision or done the right thing. I would say like, I am critical. I don't know about self serious doubts. Well, I would well, say well, it, said, it said at times, right? Yeah, it says at times, but I would think like the wording, like I would say more critical just to like really make sure that I kind of went through it in my head and be like, yeah, I made the right decision. Um, and it says at times you are extroverted, sociable, while other times you're introverted, wary, and reserved. But I would say like that's in a new situation. Like if I walk into a situation, I don't know anybody, I am not like, ah, you know, but if I know everybody in the room that I'm like, yeah, so, you know. <laughs> Wait, 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 can, can you read, just read that last one to us one more time? Uh, at times you are extroverted, social, while at other times you are introverted, wary, and reserved. Huh. And I wouldn't say that I have ever been told that I was an introvert or reserved in any part of my life. Um, but I definitely could see that I am a little bit more quiet, maybe in a little bit more sort of standoffish when I first kind of meet people. And then I kind of like, okay, but now that's different if it's kids. If I'm at the front of the class, like I come in, right? Because I now have to be that person to hopefully make it, uh, you know, a good situation for them. So I, it's interesting. It's like parts of it I can see. And then there's other parts that I read it out loud. I'm like, hmm, maybe not. So much yeah. when I say it aloud. <laughs> but, and, but when when you first took it, what was your uh, you, you you sent me a score, didn't you, of your overall reaction to how accurate you thought it was? Yeah. So when I first when I first looked at it, I was like, oh yeah, that's that's pretty much me right there, kind of nail on the head sort of thing. But then I just read it out loud to all of you, and I was like, oh, maybe it's not like quite. I just I find it very situational dependent, right? Oh. Like in a situation where. I might overthink um, a decision that I've made that like maybe like a first aid situation or something like I might debrief with someone and be like, is mm -hmm. that the process for next time that you would sort of go through just to kind of tick the boxes. But I wouldn't say that I sit in pine over all of my decisions because at the end of the day, the decision was made and I have to move on. Right. But, so I think but, but when you first, but when you first read that, your yeah. general assessment was, I think you even sent me in an email what you thought your yeah. score was, how accurate it was. Yeah, yeah. What was yeah. that? Oh, I don't remember what the email, what my email said. I think I just, I just copied and pasted that little section, but I think I said it was probably five or six, like six or seven or something like that. Like pretty strongly agreed, but yeah, it's interesting, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah it, it, it was, it was weighted toward like, yeah, pretty much got me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That. Interesting. <laughs> That is the incredible power of Barnum statements. Yeah, right? Like, and you just, you quickly read it over and you see a few things that you're like, yeah, I know I do that. So you assume it's all correct. But then yeah. when you read it out loud to someone, you're like, oh, yeah, no, maybe that's not totally correct. <laughs> yeah. So a, a Barnum statement is something, um, also, I think this is the Foyer effect, that where, where you make a, a, a statement that sounds specific but it is true for everybody yeah absolutely right? and so that's that's why 
Um, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, like the psychics will, will, will say like, you know, I'm sensing that you had, there was an experience near water when you were a child, <laughs> right? That was, that was some, a, a traumatic experience. And yeah. what about the scar on uh, the scar on your knee? Right. You know, yeah. Is it that they really can see your knee? No, it's that we all have that scar on our knee because we ran around as kids. Yeah, or like horoscopes, right? When you read them as a kid and you get your like, I don't know, when like Seventeen magazine and you flip to the horoscopes and you'd be like, yes. oh, this is going to happen, they've, right? They've got you to a T. It like never happened, right? right? So it's, it's the same sort of thing. Like, but you, you sort of read quickly and you kind of pick out a few of those parts that you're like, yeah. yes, that makes sense. But then when you really sort of analyze it, which you all just watched live, it's not really as true as you think, yeah. right? So it's really th that's, that's right, because we remember the hits and we forget the misses. Yeah, and this is something absolutely. that all the psychics depend on. We remember the hits and we forget the misses. Because absolutely. when there is a hit, this is, you know, later on, like, oh my gosh, this thing did happen with a weird dog. Right. That's what that person said. But all the 50 other things that they said, well, maybe it hasn't happened yet. And so it's a non event. And so we're not noticing that it didn't happen. Um, so you remember the hits, you forget the misses. And also you had a great example there of a statement that was both positive and negative in the same statement. Yeah. So you are, um, you know, you are uh, a, a, a gregarious and friendly person, but sometimes like to keep to yourself. <laughs> Right. And so then if you're more like to keep to yourself, you're like, yeah, I really like to keep to myself. You know, sometimes I'm friendly. <laughs> right. Um, the other person says like, yeah, I'm really gregarious. But, you know, yeah, sometimes I, I, I do that. But whatever is like more you, you notice yeah. the hit and you forget the miss. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Right. That's where they have you. Right. That's where they have you. And then you get pinpointed into these certain boxes and I mean, yeah. to a certain point, and I'm, I'm sure that you, you as being someone who's sort of, you know, big personality, sometimes you are just quiet for no reason. And so sometimes I'm quiet just for no reason. And people are like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, nothing. And they're like, but you're always excited. You're always passionate. You're always this. You've got to be upset. There's something. And I'm like, no, I'm just, just having a, a quiet day like this. This is normal, but it's yeah. like you've been labeled as that person without everybody knowing, you know, maybe the full you that, that sometimes I am just yeah. a quiet lie on the couch kind of gal, right? Like I'm not yeah. always yeah. Ah, like on all the time and it's normal for me, but maybe for other people, that's not what they see, right? So being labeled sort of in that one way is interesting. Yeah, yeah, the labels are really interesting for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of research that shows that we step into the labels that we are given and people expect us to live the labels that they give us. Yeah. So if your employer says you're an ISTJ, then you go like, oh, I'm an ISTJ. And then they expect you to be all ISTJ. -y. But really, maybe you're an uh, NFF and something P, right? You know, the um, the so these are sort of the, the the personality test, by the way, is a random Barnum statement generator. Totally. That's what it is. It pays no attention to what you put in. And you're spit out a set of Barnum statements that will generally apply to 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 to, to go with 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 everybody, right? Um, so, I mean, that stuff is. I mean, that's that's why that's why you know horoscopes seem to work. Or you can take any really general statement. And you can twist that into to being you. Um, and we start to think about what's the harm. Now, Brooke, you have been in several career situations where they have used personality inventories, personality tests, to, to make determinations about you and your place in the company and these sorts of things. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? 
Yeah. So when I first, when I began more of, I would say my professional career, I was in my early twenties and personality tests were not nearly as widespread. And I think because I started school younger, like about a year younger than my counterparts, I was just a little bit more awkward because, you know, you're younger than everybody else. You don't have that extra year of maturity. So I grew up kind of feeling like I'm this awkward kid and I don't know really where my place is with the other kids and just feeling that sense of disorientation that way. Um, I was given a personality test and it was to test my, the personality um, type, it was Myers-Briggs. And also it was to test empathy and my learning style in general. Oh, and you got learning styles packed in with that. Yes. So this one was a really comprehensive one. And oh, I remember- Oh, this is going to get good. This is going to get my, good. And it, it, I mean, I'll admit, like I learned years ago, these are not accurate ways of assessing people. But at that time, I thought, whoa, I was an INTJ. And they're like this, you know, um, one of the things you're, you're the architect and you're known for, you're going to get the job done and you don't work with other people really well. And you're going to do whatever it takes and uh, you're independent to the core. And so it, it was like, oh, well, that's why things are awkward with with me and working with others so oh. so you're, you're you're seeing that description and then you do the work of making that match your personal experience you use it as a justification especially when you don't know how to classify and we all want we we seek labels and things because it helps us make a quick determination of something and labels make things really easy but unfortunately we stigmatize and pigeonhole ourselves by thinking well if i'm really awkward and i don't communicate well in a situation it's because that's my personality type that's just who i am rather than no you know that's not who you are that was a characteristic in that moment that's not an excuse and so these tests that i was given they would reinforce certain things or they would show that you know um like one employer did a test to see how how much employees were motivated by money so and the, the results would show like this employee, mine was, she's not, she's, she's uh, motivated, not like on average with money as like a normal, I was a salesperson at one time. She's not motivated by the money. So it's like, well, how do we then motivate this person when we need to motivate her? If we need to get more results, what do we do? And then we could pay her we less. We get away with paying you less. Right. Because they you know, if she's not motivated as much by money and she's motivated more by the quality of the work, then maybe we just give her more challenging assignments. And the guy that is motivated a lot by money will give, you know, he needs kind of the more like steady pay raises, right? So there's things that motivate um, your earnings or that change your earnings. There are things that classify you there. I, I had one as a manager um, that shows what your management style is. And you have other sub managers in the company and you're compared to each other for your management style. And what that did was that pigeonholed those other managers showing, oh, you're the guy that is kind of a dictator style manager. And so now that's almost shut down his ability to feel like he could be um, a more of a collaborative leader. So, you know, and then his employees, you know, people talk in organizations. And so if you tell the employees of that manager, oh yeah, your your boss, your manager was one of like the dictatorial guys. You know, like, oh, my boss is a jerk. You know, I'll never be able to work with him. And now that collaboration potential, that's shut down even more now too, because they're both being labeled both ways. So it's been an interesting experience doing that personally with test results to find out, to get you know, an idea at that time of like, will this help me understand who I am? And then also to have it given to me and my fellow teammates from a company perspective to try to gauge our motivations and how we lead. All right. And all of that is independent of whether or not it is accurate. Correct. Right? And what does this, what does the science say on that? It says that what's happening is, especially with MBTI, which is given um, by, it's That's over 2 million people. The Myers-Briggs is taken by over 2 mil million people annually. 
And it tries to break us down into four major binaries. So you have introverted, extroverted, sensing, feeling. Let me see here. I don't remember the other two. I have them. Um, I'm sorry, thinking or feeling, sensing, intuition, and judging and perceiving. And what it does is let's say you're 49% introverted and you're 51% extroverted. You're actually more in the middle, but it's going to slam you to the opposite end or like that, that hard stop of one or the other. And most people who take these personality exam um, assessments, they're actually, they fall more in the middle. But that separates us out by having to have this kind of polarized viewpoint that then chops it down into 16 personalities. And because it is so in the middle and it is so based off of context as well. When you take the test months later, I think it's um, over a five week period, about 50% of people will receive different letter types. So th that's, that's so it's not a consistent test. So it, no. it, it, a test is trying to figure out if something is valid. Does it give the same result on the same person? No. And I'm actually so one of the things that they test for is uh, one of the caveats that um, Myers Briggs will say is like you know um, this doesn't always apply. Like like it, I forgot how it. I do have a source for this, but it was that it might not be the best determination for all things. And that, you know, people who have like a, an assessment for whether or not they'll be happy in their job, you know, it's better to just see what kind of work do they do and what do they enjoy to come up with that determination. Yeah. And if you, I've lost my train of thought, Jack, what was your initial, well, your initial well, question? Well, well, I'll, I'll just riff off of that. There, okay. There's no theoretical basis for that is a valid scientific accepted theoretical basis for why it should work in the first place. It's based right. on Carl Jung's mysticism. Yes. And um, Carl Jung, interesting person, interesting ideas, not really useful in understanding the way we, when we kind of dig down kind of what's going on with, 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 with people. And a lot of people have spent their careers kind of like, you know, giving young massages, but, but what we, 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 we tend not, we, we don't find that that is a really effective way of understanding people. Um, although you do get labels out of it. And mm -hmm. the other thing is with this system, um, is there any evidence that, um, you know, whether or not it theoretically makes sense, does the advice that it give gives, make uh, have does does that work does that really help us and there is there's there's no evidence that we're getting useful actionable information out of these things so I, theoretically it's sketchy sorry. practically it's sketchy um it's not consistent scientifically it is pseudoscience that on top of you know the whole thing of what happens when you get labels um i would like to bring um e on this if you feel comfortable with it you're mentioning something about this being given to children i think you can unmute um so uh so this is think about the effect of this on, on you brooke as an adult right um this is also being given to impressionable children. When I, I was looking into, um, so I went and I retook the Myers-Briggs because I had taken the Myers-Briggs I'd mentioned years ago and I was given one label and I wanted to see what is the new label when I come up with the same label. And then after taking the test, they have a comments section where people like to comment about the results of their test and to you know, kind of have this conversation about how accurate this feels. I looked at the comments, and this is where we're talking about how does this affect people, especially young people? And on one of the personality types, people seem to really like their personality. And they were you know, like, thank you, I can't wait you know, to grow and to know so much. And I'm speechless after reading this. And they were excited about this, this diagnosis. But then I went over to the more extreme personality type, the first one I had gotten. 
And I was reading through and seeing people post about how am I ever going to win this guy's heart then? How am I ever going to communicate? This other person just almost like they're assessing their relationships with other people based off of what this personality type says, kind of like you've become a lost cause if you're a certain combination of letters. And if you, if you give that now to a child and say, you're these things and you can never grow beyond this, they, they believe it. They could believe it and they could make it, like you said, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. We step into those labels. Um, you know, if I am told that um, I can't focus, right, then that both gives me an excuse and I'm now expecting like, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm having a hard time focusing instead of kind of focusing a little bit more. I go, like, oh, that's my label. We very often will adopt the behaviors of whatever labels were, were given. Um, you mentioned learning styles too. Yes. So, Tell us a little bit about your experience with that, because in this, it's it's basically the the same thing. For some reason, they, they like fours. They like things breaking down into units of four, um, with these uh, uh, with with these personality tests. And so there's, so what 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 do you find out you're you're getting as as your learning style? So that one, I think was 2013 that I took that one. I've saved most of the results. This is, that's, that's gold for us. Uh, uh, this one, I think it was so that they, at the heart of it, to know how much training they would have to give different employees. So, you know, are you capable of finding the information you need and learning it? So they were trying to measure aptitude, I believe, and test taking style, like just styles of learning through that. Let me see if I can, I don't want to like hold up the group here. So I'm just trying to see if I can get a snapshot on this one. And this one was given actually by a consultant. Um, so there was um, self-awareness, motivation. Um, I'm looking for the actual learning style. I don't have it in this one. I'd have to do some digging. That would take some time. But that was more on just like, how well can this person figure something out? and not have to require extra training and not have to maybe waste company time, you know, figuring out the solution. So I think that was at the heart of that one. That one's just my conjecture on it. Yeah. The, so there's a, you know, this idea popped up in education that there are people with these different types of learning styles. And if you can identify the learning style of a student, that's their preferred learning style, you then target information to that kid using that learning style, and they will be able to absorb information more quickly. That's the idea behind learning styles. And so some of us learn more through ear, hearing, some of us more through seeing, some by kinesthetically interacting with these different things. Um, and there's several different versions of these learning styles, but it's, um, but here's, here's the, the, the interesting thing, uh, uh about this. Um, oh, I actually, uh, Lindy, do you want to, uh, chime in on this? Um, uh, yeah, so, so this is that, that's, so that's the concept that you, and, and raise your paw, by the way, folks, if you have, um, if, if you've heard uh, uh this this sort of idea about learning styles in some sort of educational context yeah all right so yeah <laughs> lindy you've been exposed to this uh yeah tell us your thoughts on this well i work as an instructional coach so i work with lots and lots of teachers and um i i don't know if i've met a teacher yet that like where this hasn't come up at some, in some capacity. And I find that almost every time it comes up, it's in the context of people like really believing in this. And one of the things that I coach on um, really frequently is differentiation, right? Which is like a really big and important topic in education, which is like differentiation is how do you meet the needs of the diverse and complex learners? in your group 
And you can do that by differentiating, you know, the way that you present materials. So you can like present things in a visual way and auditorially and sensorially, um, you know, in other ways you can, you can do multimodal learning. The thing is those things benefit all learners. All of us <laughs> benefit from getting information in multiple ways and using multiple pathways in our brains. And studies have shown time and time again, they might like assess, certain studies have like assessed like large groups of people, what is your learning style? Or given them an assessment, like um, are you an auditory learner, a visual learner, um, a kinesthetic learner, right? And then they present materials to them. Um, so they might present it in the way that honors the identified learning style or they might present it in a way that does not, right? And study after study after study shows that there's just no difference no. in the way that people actually learn, whether or not they're given their preferred learning style or not. Now, one thing that research has shown is that there is something called a learning preference, which often gets mistaken with learning style. It does not mean that your, your learning preference, like maybe you are just really used to lecture style classes. And so you feel more comfortable receiving information that way. And you just haven't done a lot of like hands-on work. And so that might be a little bit more awkward for you to take in. It doesn't mean that you're not going to do as good of learning in that situation, but you might need more like mental preparation to go into that kind of situation. So like learning preferences are real, but they but with training in like you know and some exposure then it doesn't make a difference in how you learn that, that, that that's key and and that so the idea of like oh you're a visual learner i'm going to channel you into this um oh you're an auditory learner i don't have to worry about visuals in your education you know and sorry wrong answer but thank you for playing um, it turns out that that you know if I am in my class, um, I'm going to be talking to you. I'm going to be visually presenting this to your brain. A different part of it, just like when we're nature journaling, we're intentionally writing, we're intentionally using numbers, we're intentionally using pictures. Right? Oh, actually, I'm a visual learning style person, so I'm not going to do any words. I'm not going to do any numbers you're then not bringing as much of your brain and your mental trampoline to bear on whatever it is. And so that's true with all the education that we're, we're, we're doing. It turns out we all do better getting these things from a lot of different angles. Now let's pick it up and play with it. Oh, I'm kind of getting a different thing that way. Um, so the label of learning style um, can also, you know, it can impair your thinking about how you should be doing these th sorts of things. And if the teacher kind of gets your label, I'm sorry, but education is going to be rough for you because it's, it's easy to get tracked into this. Um, the, uh, so the, the, those are, you, you, you sort of mentioned in your, your chat note that this is, this is this, this myth that will not die. It really is. It really is. And I'm seeing something from Yavea just now, um, you know, that I don't know that teachers use it to exclude students from specific things. However, what I have seen it used for is um, something called like homogenous grouping. Um, so that's a tactic in differentiation that's really important, like taking some students, sometimes we take students that um, are very different and place them together strategically, like maybe there's some peer coaching that can go on, um, or sometimes we take students that are very much the same, um, or are working on the same skills or have the same challenges that they're experiencing, and that way we can like really pinpoint and target what they're doing. So I have seen teachers say like, oh, I know that these students are visual learners, and I know that these students are auditory learners, so I'm going to give them you know, a picture to analyze or a photograph, and I'm going to give them a podcast to analyze, right? And so that's a really thoughtful way of doing things, right? But if you're basing that on thinking that, and I, I don't think it's, you know, it's not wrong that teachers are doing this, they're doing it on misinformation. I think it's really well intentioned. Like they are like, you know, I'm going to make this like really thoughtful way of presenting materials for my different students learning styles. 
themselves, right? So differentiation is just like it, what it sounds like they're to make different. Um, the, the mode of instruction or the way that students show you that they learned something, right? So you might say like, oh, I know that this student um, is very auditory. So I'm actually gonna like let them, you know, put on headphones and listen to this audio book while the other students are going to, um, you know, read, read the book. Um, themselves and there's nothing wrong with an audiobook like we I love audiobooks um, but we want to make sure all our students get a chance to experience that because they can all get something different from it mm -hmm. that's that's really really useful um, but it is also really interesting that still in education it's not just that teachers some teachers were taught this a long time ago um, just it's as not there just are still around. It's not just still around. It's like still super prevalent. Like it yes. is everywhere. And and, and people are making uh, like just like the consultant businesses that are going into Brooks Workplace, right? Um, and saying we're going to give you uh, these personality profiles, or we're you know here is our personality profile based dating service, right? Here is our personality, yes, yeah, such a thing exists. Um, or, or the, you know, the, there are people making serious bank on these. Um, so the the book, uh, I think, Surrounded by Idiots, um, is a book about it breaks things down into four different personality styles. It's based on zero science, right? zero evidence and um in, in, but this stuff sells it sells because it is you know uh you know i think uh was it uh, you lindy or, or brooke who said that that the labels are easy they're easy it wasn't me but i agree <laughs> yeah, I mean, the labels are really easy and mm -hmm. Um, it's it's shorthand for thinking. I mean, one of the things that I've heard, um, and I've kind of discussed this with colleagues before, like we talk about, like well, why won't why won't this myth go away? Why? And I think one of the reasons why is kind of what you're hitting on. It's something that teachers can like wrap their heads around, like not just teachers, we can all wrap our heads around these learning styles. Like we can all identify what auditory means and what visual mm -hmm. means and what kinesthetic might mean for us to do something. We can wrap our heads around it and we can, teachers are able to use it to make really explicit instructional decisions. And if I take that away from them, that concept of learning styles, like, Am I giving them something useful to replace it with where I'm just like, no, we all kind of learn similarly. <laughs> like our brains really do work more, in, we're more alike than we are different. And I don't think that's a helpful paradigm for teachers when they're like, no, don't take away my very clean, easy labeling. Like, <laughs> you know, like don't, I mean, it's hard to take that out without replacing it with something that's like actionable, you know? Now, people don't like the answer it depends or it's nuanced or it's situational <laughs> we, we like that oh you're an estj got it yeah you want to be like you're a level n reader cool let me grab the level n books mm -hmm. you know i mean this is the same with i mean i could go on about reading reading levels too this is so applicable to that as well um, it's just not scientific and it's situational and it's contextual. Yeah, there, there, there were books that my daughter was reading that, you know, were, I, I, I thought that that is, I mean, that's pretty, there's more words on that page than that you don't know than, than five, right? And so I thought that like, maybe that shouldn't be what you should be reading, but the book was sucking her in and got her hooked and she couldn't stop turning those pages that's awesome yeah. that's um i mean how so there's there's a lot of money to be made in these these personality profiles there's lots of money to be made putting us in our categories um avea had the, the the question about you know mental health diagnoses yes 
um, there's 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 a, a lot of you know discussion that having the diagnosis may be helpful in a therapy situation to get a conversation started if the um, therapist knows the diagnosis. But very often when the patient knows their diagnosis, they we tend to do it's the same thing that our kids do. We fall into, we start, we go like, oh, that's me. Because it came from science, right? And then we... Um, we live up to whatever those expectations are. And also sometimes the labels are important and critical for like, if I wasn't labeled a, a learning disabled kid, if I didn't have my dyslexia label, then I would not have been able to get certain services that I needed to help me kind of get through my, sometimes those labels, you need the label in order to get more support in school. Uh, Avea, what are your thoughts? Um, I hope that this is, doesn't come across as being too cynical. You need the correct label. That's right. You spend your entire childhood being misdiagnosed and given the wrong meds and given the wrong treatment, it can really, really, really mess you up. And I say that coming from a lot of personal experience. Um, so the problem is that then you don't know what your diagnosis is as the patient and the doctor's treating you for the wrong diagnosis to begin with. Mm. What do you do in that situation? Because you're not allowed to have that information about yourself. You'd think that you would be able to, but like you said, then we might be following kind of like self-fulfilling prophecies or acting on our labels. But then at the same time, we don't know to say to the doctor, you're mistaken about this particular thing about me because somehow you've got the wrong information or you're asking questions that are not making a lot of sense or you're missing entire sections of what's actually really, really hurting me because you're targeting something different that I may or may not even have. And the question with that is, what do we do in that situation is my thing. Yeah. Because I think that that and personality tests and everything else, it's like, um, I think I saw Brooke say this in the chat and I agree, it's all sort of like we're trying to be understood but we're also trying to understand each other and figure out how each other's brain works and how we make decisions and how to help each other but sometimes the way that we use these things can be against people like when we have the whole we've talked before about the whole in group and the way that we don't want to go against what other people are saying in our groups so if you got their mob mentality then we're attacking people with certain labels that's why people with mental health issues wind up being disparaged so widely by society is because we we think one type of mental illness is the same as another type of mental illness and then we might separate actions from the mental illness itself so you might have somebody who has schizophrenia and who also happens to be very violent doesn't mean that all schizophrenics are violent mm -hmm. it might just mean that this person has the reaction to the world by being violent and so you can treat the schizophrenia maybe they're even in treatment and then they're still violent and so it's challenging because you're simultaneously trying to figure out a person's thoughts. And then sometimes the only way we can figure out a person's thoughts is how they act. And sometimes what they're thinking or what's up in their heads and what they're acting aren't necessarily going to make a very good correlation with each other with the label that we give their brain versus how they act. And I don't know if I'm making a lot of sense. No, no absolutely. And and that, I think this sort of also ties in with something that uh, Laura Markham was suggesting about sort of also we've got all these differences and we sort of turn them into a pathology. Could I I'd love to bring Laura in on that and also see that Kate has her hand up. So after that, Kate, we're also going to be bouncing over and joining you. Um, uh, Laura, is it all right if I add you into the spotlight? Sure. I mean, I think our biggest example is um, uh, most obvious one that comes to mind is sexuality, right? Up until it was listed in the DSM, uh, being homosexual was, you know, a, a, was something to be treated, it was something that was, that was wrong. Um, my son is autistic. It's, um, definitely there are he has challenges but then so is my daughter so does my daughter who's dyslexic and my daughter who has adhd we all have our neurodivergent uh 
parts of ourselves that make the, you know, when you're not, you don't fit. And when people, this, this goes along with, it, it's not just mental illness, it's not just personality, but it's, you know, um, color and gender and anything where somebody is different, there's bias. And, you know, the degree to which we make it lesser, you know, I mean, we, we do it with mental health by saying somebody, you know, is not as capable or, you know, should not somehow be embraced by society, but we've done the same thing with everybody else, you know, at, at one point at, with all sorts of differences. Um, but my own personal feeling is with mental health and disability is, is still, it is still politically correct for so many people to just still go ahead and uh, continue to discriminate and have bias. And, you know, why should we let somebody who has a disability have a job, this job, if they can't do exactly what somebody else can do, right? That's not because we have that capitalistic perception of worth that, you know, our worth is completely about our product. Mm -hmm. And um, same thing with, you know, well, you know, if somebody needs to be able to take time, <laughs> you know, to get breaks, or uh, I met a student who uh, got drummed out of his graduate program because he needed to take a time during the week to go see a counselor because he had depression. But that wasn't, he wasn't showing enough dedication to his job, to his, mm. his thing. So you don't want this enough. Oh my gosh. Mm. That is just, you know, so people try to understand the world and, and our brains work this way of finding patterns, right? And, and trying to make sense of it. And we have this innate desire to um, have these patterns and our brain uses our biases to help us in some situations but that tendency has take has completely upended our the complex culture you know we are not simple easy and I, I don't even know whether you know dingoes or whatever really are simple and easy social beings but um right people study them and they've gotten it wrong based on their assumptions you know um but the thing that kept us alive because it kept us away from saber-toothed cats is the same thing that builds builds walls and barriers between us and and lets mm -hmm. us trample on other people and right. say yeah. that they're not worth it so a, a a simple kind of similarity heuristic helps us sort of define our group versus the other group and at a certain time probably had a real adaptive advantage um and now we've got a lot of those creature comforts taken care of and a lot of those same forces are pushing us apart hmm Laura, thank you so much for that thought. Um, I'd like to bring in Kate and then bounce over to Avea. Um, unless uh, Avea, just what you were about to say, does it tie directly to what Laura just said? It does, but I can come back. Um, okay. I want to give Kate. That'll, that'll be okay. All right. Well, let's let's uh, join Kate and then um, Avea. Um, Kate, thank you so much for being with us. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, so the. Um, I, I just wanted to bring up Lindy's point that she brought up in the chat about how those labels and that sort of like in grouping kind of thing can be really helpful for um, advocacy and for getting the supports, um, which you kind of you talked about with um, getting a dyslexic um, diagnosis um, that having that um, like the group support of advocating. So like that in group, in group and out group, but creating an in-group based around a label sometimes can be helpful. Like, um, and somebody mentioned in the chat too, with um, autistic people being able to um, like group together and all push for supports, um, you know, and that sort of change can help everyone. Um, you know, I just wanted to share my personal experience. So I worked um, 
as a part-time art teacher um, for the public schools uh, for a few years. And um, I was given at the beginning of the year this giant binder of every student's IEP and 504 and all their special modifications. And I would have I had, you know, over 300 students. I worked um, 17 hours a week and that was all I got paid for. <laughs> so the amount of time to like process how many students need all these sort of different differentiations and supports was like obviously way, way beyond my pay grade or ability or my training or anything like my, like nobody can remember which kid in which class needs exactly which support. And so I just went through and I made a list of all the supports. And I said, any student that ever needs any of these, I'm going to make sure they have them. And these are all tools that I can use with any of my students that are having a hard time for whatever reason. And I don't need to have a diagnosis. I don't need to have a reason. They don't need to come in with like a doctor's note or a parent note or whatever saying, oh, I'm having a hard time today or whatever. Just a student comes into my classroom and is being all squirrely and is having a hard time settling down. I have all of these different techniques and, and different supports that I can offer them. And so when you're talking about learning styles, right? Like you talk about differentiation. Like, I think that's so awesome that to say, oh, here, you can either analyze a podcast, you can analyze a video, you can analyze a photograph, or you can analyze an article because on different days, we're gonna be capable of processing information in different ways. We're gonna need different types of support, you know? And so that's like, Eva, your, your comment about like labels and diagnoses is really about like what sort of um, like medications are we, you know, like might help in our situation, like what kind of supports, what kind of modifications, um, you know, might, might, and uh, might be appropriate, right? And so the, the ideal situation is that even if a doctor has a diagnosis in mind and is giving you these like medications or supports or things, and they're like, wow, it's not changing, it's not getting better. Just like I see in with my students, like just because the student had sat down, the parent sat down with the admin, all those sort of things, and they all hashed out and they said, this student needs to have written on, on a board, you know, the three things that they need to be doing um, doesn't mean that's always going to work for them. Doesn't mean that that's going to be like the best support. Um, and doesn't mean that they're the only student ever who should ever get that kind of support too, um, which I, you know, and so I think it's, it's all these sort of things, um, you know, they can be helpful in, in just that kind of, uh, if you have this sort of identity, it can give you the strength to speak up and to say something. So I got an IADHD diagnosis and I did the same thing of just saying like, yeah. because I had teachers stopping me in the hallway and being like, okay, here's, here's this project that I want you to accomplish. And I want you to remember all of these things. And they're stopping me in the hallway while I have a cart full of supplies and I'm walking between classes. And like, there's, I don't know who is capable of processing all that information, remembering it, and also like teaching a whole class of multiple kids and coming back and putting all the way this, you know, I was like, this is craziness. And so I came in, you know, to the, the principal's office and I sat down, I had a meeting and I said, hey, I have ADHD. You know, one of the supports that I really need is I need written instructions. And so if a student, teacher has, you know, something they want to communicate to me, I need to have written instructions. And I thought it was absurd because I had been asking for that. It's not an unreasonable thing to ask whether you have a diagnosis or not. Um, but it gave me, because they have this training and this background and this like, you know, legal requirement to, to accept that. And I think it's more about, you know, all the learning styles and the personality styles is should be more about like, hey, this person doesn't always want to come to a big party that might not be the like most fun thing, you know, but that should be true for absolutely everybody. Like, it was my birthday recently. And I like was like, I want a big party. And then I got to the party and I go, no, this is not actually what I wanted, despite being an extrovert. And I think it's that sort of like, ability and knowing I have so many friends who are introverts who talk about their experiences and what they prefer being like, okay, noted what I might actually need is some alone time. <laughs> like, you know, because this is feeling overwhelming to me because I've seen people who experience that and they articulate their feelings really well. And it's not so much about there. I am only this one label and I always exist in this exact same way. Um, but having that label can help us like, I don't know. I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead, Yvea. I was going to say that what I was going to say ties into what both Kate and also Laura said. What I was going to say was that a lot of times with the labels or the tests, what winds up mattering is how we use it, is what we use it for. So for example, if we use a diagnosis, um, okay, I'm going to name a, a few different situations. If you are in a family, 
and you're the only person who goes to therapy and the therapist gives you a diagnosis and then lets your parents know, then if your parents are the type who say, oh, everything messed up about our family is because of that person, they have a diagnosis to prove it and they make you the designated patient of the family because that's not really solving anything. That's a fixed mindset. If you are instead saying, oh, actually here, I'll just name a personal one. I had some stuff going on in my head since I was about 10 and a half. And it took me until I was 29 to get diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. And what happened was that I felt this incredible sigh of relief because there were things happening in my head that I didn't understand and didn't have words for, and I couldn't figure out how to describe it. And everybody looked at me like I was crazy. And the minute I got my diagnosis, suddenly I had a way of describing what was going on. And it made me feel I don't know, it's hard to put words into it, but like it was possible then to figure out what to do next. And so when you use your labels as a growth mindset then, and Susan was mentioning this earlier too about fixed versus growth mindset, then you begin to figure out how can I help myself? Then you begin to look for tools. Um, so if you're saying, there's something going on, I don't know quite what it is. And then you happen to take, you know, either a diagnosis or interestingly, even if you wind up taking a personality test and they give you certain information that then you use to help yourself, then that's maybe an example of a personality test being not so bad. Yeah, it's not something you should go around labeling everybody with. You do that at work. You say, oh, take this personality test so I can pigeonhole you. Again, an example of not using a label for a good thing. On the other hand, you take Myers-Briggs and you suddenly find out that you're an INFJ and you didn't expect to be that way. And then you read some articles and then they mention that that gives you more, um, more, you know, empathic tendencies where you try to read emotions and that that overwhelms you. And you're like, oh, that's why I'm feeling so overwhelmed all the time is because I'm constantly reading the room. Then it makes you aware of an issue that you might be having. And then the important thing about that isn't what your actual personality test result was. It was that it made you aware of a thing that was troubling you and you didn't know how to change. And now you might have some ideas. So that's what I think about the labels. They're only <laughs> as useful as how we use them. They're only as useful as how we use them. They're only as useful as how other people help us with them. Um, if you have a diagnosis, maybe your child doesn't actually have ADHD, but the child um, having the diagnosis perhaps of sensory processing disorder doesn't yet exist in the school district. So your doctor decides to give the child the diagnosis of ADHD in order to get them resources from the system. Yeah, it's not a correct diagnosis, but at least then you're getting resources from the school district that maybe doesn't give a lot of resources. Um, Maybe then you find out that it might be SPD. Maybe it's not actually SPD, but you're looking into books and you're saying, oh, this looks like a thing my child struggles with here, 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 and here. And so suddenly, even if the label itself isn't correct, you suddenly have vocabulary to describe what's going on. Um, and so I wanted to just put that out there for consideration. Oh yeah, one more thing. Nice little diagram that I did that my therapist, one of my therapists taught me at one point. Suppose we have a person, their name is Jane. They're a pretty flower here, and yes, they are Asteraceae on purpose because that means that all of the indefinable little disc flowers here are the parts of our personalities that will never have words. That's why the disc flowers are not labeled. But our ray flowers over here, yes, let's pretend that our ray flowers have labels, and let's pretend that I didn't do this because I wanted to add straps, and instead I wanted to say that these are the petals that Jane likes the most. Um, so Jane here identifies as a nature enthusiast, um, nature enthusiast. I said that wrong. I was thinking nature enthusiastic, whatever. Former high school valedictorian. She, for some reason, cares about astrology and says she's an Aries, like Jack. Um, she's also identifies as being a rock climber and as Breck's fiance, who Breck is. Then there are also these other things that may be on her flower. Maybe she also is a verbal interpersonal learner, according to some source. But if she doesn't care about that, then why do we? Um, she also has thalassophobia. So in other words, don't ever ask her to go deep sea diving. She's going to say no. Um, she also, for some reason, took Myers-Briggs and, ident and was identified as ESTP. Again, does this actually help her? Or is this a pedal we need to just that flutter in the wind. Um, she happens to have a job as a do Zoom technician. Why this isn't more bolded up? Maybe she just doesn't care about her job that much. She cares more about rock climbing, but she doesn't have a job that lets her go rock climbing. She has Graves' disease. Maybe that's important for a health reason. And she happens to be an insect lover like Susan. So why do we care about this? Is it because then Susan can look at her petal and say, oh, you love insects. I can talk to you about this. Is it so the doctors can say, oh, you have Graves' disease. Let's help you. Is it so that some 
unpleasant supervisor at work can say you're ESTP, I'm going to force you into doing jobs that maybe aren't really right, like the, what they did to Brooke, which is wrong with them. It depends on how you're going to use the pedals. And also, if any of the any of the ray flowers are giving her trouble and she needs to know how to identify them, or maybe she doesn't and maybe one of these others helps. In other words, we're complicated, like the flowers of Asteraceae. And I think other people have things to say. Thank you for listening. Yeah, um, John, you're muted, but. That, wasn't that a great example of visual thinking? Um, so you're for, a visual learner. Yeah, yeah, so for, <laughs> yeah, but, but that was only for the visual learners. So for, but the, uh, but yeah, but, but we basically find with the learning styles is that if you're presenting something visually and auditorially, this is, this is better. Our brains can actually parallel process this stuff and, and we're, we're, we're doing better with that. And so that was, uh, that was good for my learning style and uh, everybody who doesn't have that learning style. Um, I want to bring uh, Aisha in on the conversation here, and then we're going to jump over to Lindy. Lindy, I'm going to suggest that you write down just um, a couple of thoughts of the thought that is in your head. So, because sometimes when I kind of hold my tongue on something, I then forget what it is, and I'm really interested in what your thought was. Cool. Uh, Aisha. Um, let's see. And we're going to add Spotlight. Hey there, Aisha. Hey. Thanks. Yeah, I also had to scribble little notes because <laughs> as Avia was talking, my mind went that way, and then it went that way, and then another petal unfurled, and then another petal unfurled of thinking. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Thank you for that beautiful drawing. Um, you know, I was actually going to say that when the labels are helpful, like for you, it was when um, somebody actually told me to read a book about empaths, and it was the same. I was just like, Oh my God, <laughs> no wonder I am overwhelmed in so many settings. Um, and what I was saying to Billy Joe in the chat, and I think it connects to that too, it's given me a lot more permissions to explain myself sometimes or to avoid situations or to walk away or to take care of myself. Cause I discovered even stuff even comes through Zoom at me, which I was like, Jesus, that's like empaths on steroids. Um, but now I notice it and can go, this sad feeling is not your sad feeling, it's their sad feeling. What are you going to do with it to take care of yourself? So it just also had that aha. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, something I put in the chat, but I wanted to bring up again was how it was. I think it's like your pedal analogy. Um, my beloved student who got an eating disorder uh, in middle school during um, the pandemic, and she's kind of my adopted niece, also the family adopted me, or she adopted me rather. Um, but they just kind of kept saying the big thing they were learning is that she is not the eating disorder, it is something she is struggling with. And I thought that language was so important. It was a huge growth moment for me, which is why I want to share that here. And so we talk about everything else when we get together, her love of books, her love of art, she plays the mandolin. And then there's always space. I'm like, do you want to talk about anything else going on? Or, you know, how, do you want to share anything or, you know, not? She loves redwoods. I take her to the redwoods. So she is not her eating disorder. Um, so, right. It's exactly. It's like the behavior analogy. You're not bad. You're just doing a bad thing right now. Or you're behaving in a way. So I wanted to sort of really highlight that. Uh, and the third one I wanted to share is that because we're all nature journaling educators here. Um, and when Lindy was talking about specifically working in schools and Kate too, it reminded me of um, the big thing I would do was try and drag out classroom teachers to see their students in the outside environment because a few of them, the teachers who did come along, the kindergarten teachers always came along because they're like, you're kidding, it's so fun. Um, Oops, little side thing, you know, and Billy Joe or no, and Jack Laws were talking about this, like you jump into a label and I am a very different personality type when I am teaching. I'm a very super bubbly. I'm a lot more like Billy Joe, actually. And I remember in August feeling like I was going to put on the spacesuit of the Aisha, the really fun nature teacher. Um, and I enjoyed it until I stopped enjoying it. And I was just like, I don't want to be that effervescent always 
um, it's taking it out of me because I'm actually way more on the introvert thing and need quiet and all. Um, but anyway, that was a little, was that a disc flower or a ray flower? I don't know. Um, but the outside piece, right? I had teachers show up and go, I had no idea that student could be focused and that focused and for that long. And I was like, are you telling me they behave differently inside? And it was such a like moment um, for me uh, that I started bringing that up at faculty meetings again and again in August. I was like, I really encourage you once you've labeled your students <laughs> to actually come see them in a completely different context because they might surprise you and you might see different ways of reaching them. Um, and that was preschool through fifth grade who is I mostly worked with. So, and I know we had talked about situational, um, but that was such a big consistent one. And I think we're all that way, right? We're all drawn to nature journaling because we all like to be outside. And I know I'm my better self um, a self I want to be when I am in nature and I am this weird, anxious, depressed person <laughs> if I'm inside for too many hours on the computer, <laughs> right? So if I took a test, the same test would manifest completely differently if I had been in the woods for a couple of days or even an hour versus I'd been stuck at home, um, mostly on the computer. So um, I just wanted to bring that up again since you know nature journaling is sort of our underpinning that we're tapping into different aspects of these kids and letting them see that they can exhibit this other aspect right and then we can do the metacognitive piece of like you know I saw you really focused on that or really enjoying that or really happy or you know whatever we might be watching for uh, if they're self-labeling too much um, which we've heard, right? I've heard that autistic kids will have real self-esteem issues and start self-labeling in all sorts of ways. So um, it's another place to um, reinforce that. And that'd be it. Ooh. Thank you. Yeah. The, Aisha, there's a lot of there's a lot of really cool studies linking like ADHD and focus and concentration with green spaces. And I just made me think of that. Um, yeah, I work for Green Schoolyards America now. So we try and collate all that research. So it's easily available to anybody oh. who needs to make the case to their principal or school district or superintendent or at whatever level. Do you mind yeah. dropping like a link to your organization in the chat? I would love to check that out. Sure. Let's also put that link in the show notes when we post it. That'd be great. Please. Yeah, um, just yeah, really interesting to think about also like how you know, that idea of changing the situation and you change the label and that then changes the relationship between the teacher and the student. And that can go both ways. Um, I was having really difficult time with a student in my daughter's class. I was teaching nature journaling in my daughter's class. And um, it was a really challenging relationship with one of these students. Um, my daughter joined the basketball team at a school because there's no tryouts and she didn't know how to play, but that didn't matter. Um, the this uh, so I would show up at those and I would come up with all sorts of cheers for our team and that kid was there and was cheering them on and through that sort of sports context, I made a connection with the kid that then changed my the way I thought about the kid and also the way that the kid thought about me, and then that then carried over into the nature journaling classes. Um, now, Brooke, I'm sorry, uh, Lindy, you had written something down a moment ago. I did. Um, it, it kind of ties in with what Kate brought up earlier and Yve was talking about, and I just think it's kind of irrelevant. It, it seeps through a lot of the parts of this, and I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll be really quick. But I think as a good example of like how labels can be beneficial, but also they aren't the end all be all. Um, kind of what Laura was talking about as well. Um, I am dyslexic. I have a dys dyslexia label, but my dyslexia is probably very different from yours, Jack. Um, yep. Mine is orthographic. 
So it is only in spelling, never affected my reading. I mean, I don't know what, what kind you have, but I work with children with dyslexia and um, most of them are diagnosed and labeled. Some of them are not and have moved through school, um, but struggle with reading and or writing in very specific ways. And all of the children I work with, with or without the dyslexia label, all have very different challenges that present in very different ways and very different strengths as well. So the label can be really useful because we can sit in a meeting and gather together their teachers and specialists and make sure that they are getting the accommodations that they are legally entitled to so that they can succeed in their classroom spaces. But the label dyslexia tells you nothing about the student, <laughs> like generally just like nothing. It doesn't tell you what their interests are. It doesn't tell you how they're motivated. It doesn't tell you, you know, how they function in the classroom really. Um, I went through most of grade school without that label. So, you know, it wasn't something that was noticed. I mean, it was noticed in that I was constantly being like pulled out for remediation for, for spelling, but it wasn't noticed uh, in a formal diagnosis setting. Um, and I wasn't legally mandated to receive services. No. But I see students who struggle with the same type of dyslexia that I have that, that impacts their learning a lot differently than it impacted my learning as a student. Um, it just, it just, it doesn't tell you very much about who we are as learners or about the way we move through the world. So important, but it's just one small piece of the story. Um, and so like having kind of an understanding of things as a spectrum and more complex, like Laura was saying earlier, like it just, it's, um, it's really important and Kate kind of mentioned like you know, I go through all of the paperwork with all of my students' IEPs and, all, and I get ready all of those tools and accommodations, but there may be students who are not diagnosed but could really use some of those tools and accommodations. You might have a diagnosed student and that accommodation does not work for them. <laughs> like, or, or it's so, the wrong diagnosis. That's, maybe it's maybe the wrong diagnosis. Sense. Maybe it's the right diagnosis, wrong strategy. Like it just, it, so it can be a helpful starting point, mm. but it's just not the whole story. So I, I want to, so uh, uh, let's write, type into the chat, a helpful starting point, but not the end of the story. That's, I think that's, that's a, that's a, a key thing. Like perhaps it's a start of a discussion. So some, some things like the personality tests where they are trying to put people into personality types, read scam. And, and 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 run, don't walk. But but a, 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 a this is different than sort of a, a, a careful diagnosis. But any of our labels can be. Uh, it can be a, a, a useful thing. It can be a, a dangerous thing. Uh, something that happens to a lot of the kids who are undiagnosed is that there is another very handy label that comes to mind, which is stupid. And that's, that's, that's the way I framed myself. Um, when even after I had been diagnosed, I didn't understand my diagnosis. And so that I thought I was just the dumb kid. Um, and um, so sometimes uh, the more specific we can be, then I think that does help those labels be more useful. So labels can be useful labels also can be dangerous because labels can be easy and labels can make us do sloppy thinking. Um, so just as I look out into the yard and I see Scrub J, and I'm going to record Scrub J in my journal, um, I could write down Scrub J, or I could really look at that Scrub J and pay attention to that Scrub J and learn something new from that Scrub J. And so too with the, the child or the learner. I need to, the, the easy thing to do is to label and if i say scrub j okay there's there's that little label let's go deeper let's go deeper and let's go deeper and that takes the work of paying attention and the more that we are able to do that for our students the more we will help them the more we will actually encounter them as as a real being instead of as as their label 
And in so doing, let's just remember that all of us are, are in the process of dynamic change all the time. And that continuums and spectrums, like so you're not like a, a, a you don't, you've got the you've got a label which is which may account for a, a huge amount of a, of a continuum. Um, and um, it is sometimes difficult to keep those sort of things in 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 contract in context and in mind. Um, but really appreciate your thinking about um, everybody's thinking you brought to the table on this. Um, perhaps to kind of wrap us out here because it's about time for lunch, and my um, I, I, uh, Avea, um, let's let's bounce back to you and um, any last thoughts. Again, I want before we do just want to thank everybody for for sharing your thoughts, ideas, um, comments, love, insights. Um, uh, Brooke, thank you so much for for being with us. Um, Billy Joe, um, Avea, um, and all the people who have participated in our conversations here. Uh, Kate, Laura, um, we're really appreciating that as well as your insights in the chat. Um, Avea. So two things. First, a thing to say and then a question to end with to keep thinking about. For one, um, a reminder about labels, tests, all of the other things. They're tools. We use them when they're useful and we set them aside when they're not. And the question, how does this relate to us with our idea about words, pictures, and numbers in nature journaling and how we might identify with one more than the others? I want people to think about that in the future, especially because, for example, I've heard you say before, Jack, that you are one who is more of a visual thinker, prefer the pictures, et cetera. And yet I want to say that you're the one who changed my thinking about words. Before I thought about this, I would think of words as being a thing that we wrote down. I would think of the written because of the journal. And yet your puns and your ability to play with language is one of the most amazing I've ever met to the point where I think of you as having a very big strength in words. So I want people to think about how we label ourselves in nature journaling going forward too. And if maybe we're using those three languages in ways that we wouldn't necessarily expect. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. But you're muted, Jack. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you all again soon. <laughs>